Здравствуйте. I mean, I just had an opportunity yesterday to see around, but I'm sure it's so beautiful that you need to come again and again. <laughs> so, coming to the topic, uh, it's hypothermia along with radiotherapy. And I would like to summarize some of the clinical trials which we had just heard. And this is actually, I am at the Canton Hospital in Switzerland at and this hospital actually has the hypothermia only center in Switzerland which has hypothermia since 2006. We just heard uh, Dr. Kobe uh, presenting about breast and cervix mainly. So I will take it from there and then try to see what are the results that we have got using hypothermia and radiotherapy, the published literature. Now, hypothermia is certainly a unique therapeutic modality with unique abilities. And as defined, it's something, a temperature which we play with around, say, 40 or 39 to 43 degrees centigrade. And it increases blood flow Yes, I think we all agree to it. It improves the tissue oxygenation. It also thereby sensitizes or increases the oxygenation of the hypoxic cells and thereby making it heat sensitive. It inhibits the DNA repair, which is I think one of the major factors of a loss of radiation sensitivity. It also sensitizes the S phase cells and there are certain tumor cells like melanomas which are supposed to be intrinsically heat sensitive. So these are some of the things which actually hypothermia is doing for us. And now if you look at very closely, these three, oxygenation, hypoxic cells being heat sensitive, an inhibition of a DNA repair. In fact, these are the properties which are similar to any high LED radiation like carbons. So hypothermia, in fact, has properties which mimic that of a high LED radiation and in fact could even be termed very rightly as a poor man's high LED radiation. So if we take all these together, one thing comes out that indeed it is a potent radio sensitizer. It has also been shown to be synergistic to a number of chemotherapeutic agents and above all, I think what we just heard from our various colleagues that there's no significant added morbidity. So therefore, is there any treatment which is as unique as hypothermia? I don't think so. So, I think I'm not very wrong to say that hypothermia is indeed a unique therapeutic modality with unique abilities and therefore we need to see it more closely. Let me take you a bit more to why we are calling this thinner thermal synergism. We call it hypothermia radiation, but why? Why should we add these two together? Well, we know a tumor can have cells which are well oxygenated, which are at normal pH, which are sufficient nutrients, and where the cells are in a proliferative stage. And these cells are in fact heat resistant, but radio sensitive. And on the other hand, there could be cells which are hypoxic, and thereby at low pH, insufficient nutrients, no proliferations, and these are heat sensitive, but radio resistant. So if we combine hypothermia and radiation, in fact, both of these are acting complementary to each other. 
and that's the thermal synergism that we are talking when we are adding hypothermia and radiotherapy. So I just quote from a recent editorial published in November 2013 in the Green Journal by Jens Overgott. And it gives the title saying that the heat is still on. And he goes on to say that there is sufficient underlying biology to argue for a substantial benefit and hypothermic oncology represents the strongest mean to improve ionizing radiation which we have ever seen and is far superior to any other type of biological modifications. Not only this, he goes on to add that the most powerful way of sensitizing ionizing radiation in fact is heat and this needs to be fully explored of combining radiotherapy and hypothermia but must be done with an open mind and a cool head. So I think it's time to look back and see what has hypothermia really done in various sites. And that's what I intend to do. So the first question that comes in this era of when we talk of evidence, evidence, evidence. Well, do we have enough evidence of radiotherapy and hypothermia to be better than radiotherapy alone? So the pyramid of, in fact, this so-called evidence-based medicine is, in fact, as we all know, the top is when we have systemic, systematic reviews and the meta-analysis. So if we can try and have a look and do a systematic review and do a meta-analysis, perhaps we can find the answer. So let's see. So we try to do a systematic review for all sites which have been reported using radiotherapy and hypothermia versus radiotherapy alone. Because the first question that we want to answer is, is radiotherapy hypothermia better than radiotherapy? If so, why are we really practicing radiotherapy alone? Why not add hypothermia? Then comes the question, can we further increase it by adding chemotherapy? So that's a step two. So let's first confirm about the step one. So there are certain studies which have used radiotherapy versus radiotherapy and hypothermia. And there are certain studies which have used chemotherapy, as our friend Rahman just said, about chemotherapy versus chemotherapy and hypothermia. And when we looked at the literature, based on a med nine search last year in December 2014, using search terms as hypothermia and clinical trials, we found 518 citations, of which 38 deal with radiotherapy versus radiotherapy and hypothermia. A total of about 3,500 patients, roughly distributed in both the groups, about 1,700 odd in each. And then there were four studies which compared chemotherapy versus chemo therapy and hypothermia, which of course I'm not going to deal in this presentation. So I would restrict myself to only radiotherapy versus radiotherapy and hypothermia. So that's the group that we need to look into it. Now this is a summary table of all the studies which have been reported till date, all the 38 studies of radiotherapy and hypothermia. And certainly I don't want to torture you by stretching and trying to look what the figures are here. So I just try to make a summary for you. And that's a summary table. And if you look across the table, this has sites from breast, cervix, head and neck, rectum, bladder, esophagus, lungs, superficial tumors, melanomas, anal canal, choroidal melanomas, some miscellaneous tumors. And if you look at all sites combined, that's the figure, 39.8% achieving a complete response 
with radi- radiotherapy versus about 55% with radiotherapy hypothermia. The odds ratio is 2.3. That's the odds of achieving a complete response with radiotherapy and hypothermia is 2.3 times. So that's what we have when we combine all these together. And now, because these three sites, the breast, cervix, and head and neck, are perhaps the most common sites that have been treated. So therefore, let's try to have a closer look at at least these these three sites. So first, and we heard Kobe speaking on the recurrent breast cancer, and she showed impressive results from our center. And now I'm just trying to collate some of these. So we did again a systematic review, systematic review, and this was done as per the PRISMA guidelines. And we scanned through about 708 records from the major databases which you see, Embase, PubMed, Cochrane, Scopus, ScienceGov, and some others. And from 708 records, we came down to 26 single arm studies and two and eight two arm studies. The single arm studies, 26, had actually 779 patients, and the eight two arm studies had 627 patients, roughly 300 each with radiotherapy or radiotherapy and hypothermia. We looked at the complete response because, you know, most of these patients have been previously treated with surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy combinations, and many of these patients actually had a distant metastasis all. So we were used trying to see what hypothermia has done as a palliative treatment. And for that, we used the effect measures for radiotherapy versus radiothermia. And the standard way, of course, is the odd ratios, the risk ratio, the risk difference, which would give basically which is the better and by how much percent. And these are the standard calculation I'm sure all of you are aware of, that how these are calculated, and also then go with the forest plots. Now, if we look at the endpoints for complete response, odd ratios, from eight studies of 627 patients. The radiotherapy group had a complete response of 38%. With hypothermia, it increased to 60%. And that's the forest plot for the odds ratio. And what you find here is a nicely diamond here placed well in this side, which gives, in fact, an odd ratio of 2.6, which is highly significant, favoring radiotherapy and hypothermia. If we look at the risk difference, because that would give an estimate of how much is the gain, the risk difference is again 0.2 to 3, as you can see here, which in fact, shows that the risk difference of 0.22, which is highly significant, and thereby the probability of achieving a complete response with radiotherapy and hypothermia is in fact increased by 22% over radiotherapy alone. Is there any treatment which gives you that benefit? Any chemotherapy? Any hormone therapy? Any biological markers? I don't know. But here is a treatment modality which has shown, at least in randomized trials. For patients who have been previously treated by all the treatment modalities which we usually practice. Now, although there were eight studies which were two-armed, as I said, there were a number of studies which were single-arm. So we certainly wanted to look about those patients because they had about 780 patients, 16 studies. And this is what the event rate forest plot is. And what it shows is the event rate of about 
0.643 here, which in fact gives that the complete response is about 66.6%, that is two thirds of your patients are going to achieve a complete response at an even rate of 0.64. So that's the story of uh, using hypothermia for locally recurrent breast cancer. So I think I can conclude for locally recurrent breast cancer, hypothermia and radiotherapy is an effective, safe modality to treat the local regional recurrent breast cancer. And you could expect a complete response increased over radiotherapy alone by around 22%. So that's the evidence for you. Now let's move to the next site, which I said was head and neck cancer. Now head and neck cancer, again a systematic review, searching the major databases, 498 records scanned, and there were six studies which were included, five which were randomized, and one was non-randomized. The total number of patients, 451, again divided almost equally, about 230, 220 patients in these two groups. The complete response with radiotherapy alone reported was about 40%, with hypothermia, it went up to 62.5%. And that's the odds ratios and the forest plots. And here you see the overall effect of 2.92, which is certainly significant. If I look at the risk difference now, with this complete response, the risk difference is about 0.25, which means that the probability of achieving complete response with hypothermia and radiotherapy is in fact increased by over 25% over RT alone. The thing is that why complete response? What does it mean in terms of survivals? Well, unfortunately, most of, this, most of these studies had survival figures for one year, two years, some three years. So we didn't really get into that, but we know that complete response at the end of radiotherapy is certainly a key prognostic factor as is evident from this study reported in the Green Journal in 2011. So a complete response at the end of RT is likely a predictor of survival and therefore we could expect that the patients who achieved a complete response would certainly go on to have a prolonged and a better survival. So, for head and neck, hypothermia and radiotherapy is an, indeed an effective, a safe modality again to treat stage 3s and stage 4 because most of the studies were in stage 3s and stage 4. We are not talking about stage 1 and stage 2 as none of these patients were in stage 1 and stage 2. So, locally advanced head and neck cancer, treatment of choice again between hypothermia and radiotherapy versus radiotherapy alone would be a combined treatment modality. And you could expect an increased in complete response without any added morbidity by around 25%. Now let's come to the third site, that is cancer cervix. And we just heard in the morning again from Kobe about cancer cervix, the various trials with radiotherapy, hypothermia, and of course, the problem that now most of us started believing that the treatment of choice for cervix is indeed chemoradiotherapy. And that's what we practice. So therefore, we did a systematic review again, 452 records. Finally, came down to seven articles of which six were randomized and one was unrandomized. So total number of patients about 388, radiotherapy alone 215 patients, with hypothermia 173 patients. The question was that if we all believe that chemotherapy and radiotherapy is a standard of care, then how does radiotherapy and hypothermia really compare with chemo RT, especially in locally advanced cancer cervix? 
So this, in fact, is from the NCI announcement made in 1989. And you can read perhaps the last line here, and I will read it for you. The National Cancer Institute today mailed a clinical announcement to thousands of physicians stating that strong consideration should be given to adding chemotherapy to radiation therapy and treatment of invasive cancer cervix. And then every one of us started to use and believe that this is what is to be done for all our patients of locally advanced cancer cervix. Were we right? Or did we make some mistakes? Well, NCI guidelines, NCCN guidelines, even 2015 says that for stage 1b to 4a, the primary treatment modality is concurrent chemo RT. But then what is the results? And therefore, the primary question is, if we believe in evidence-based medicine, has chemo radiotherapy improved the outcomes in the locally advanced cancer cervix to 4 to 4A? And therefore, I present before you this systematic review, not done by me, but reported in JCO in 2008 from the Cochrane Group, which is entitled Reducing the uncertainties about effects of chemo radiotherapy for cervical cancers from 18 randomized trials. And if we read this article, and I bring it out for you, the results, it says that on the basis of 13 trials that compared chemo radiotherapy versus the same radiotherapy, there was a 6%, just 6% improvement in 5 year survival with chemo radiotherapy. And it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say the relative effect of chemo radiotherapy by tumor stage. So you are interested for locally advanced cervix. It says that the benefit of chemo radiotherapy decreases with increasing stage. Which means that if there is an early tumor, chemo radiotherapy helps. If there is an advanced tumor, chemo radiotherapy doesn't help. This is a statement from Cochrane. 18 randomized trials after the NCI announcement. And therefore, this is what is there. And again, this is a collection of all trials. Stage 1, stage 2, stage B, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, combinations. It's all together. So I had to filter it out. Only those trials which used locally advanced cancer cervix and see what was the results. So seven out of the 18 trials from the Cochrane Metalysis 2008 were selected, which had patients only in stage 2B to 4A. They used two arms, pure two arms, of chemotherapy versus radiotherapy alone. They did not use any surgery no new adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy. So that was a peer group which we want to see. And since this paper came out, or Cochrane was done in 2008, so I had to scan a bit to find out all the trials reported till date. So there were additional eight trials, which were four of them were published before 2008, which were not included in this meta-analysis, and four after 2008. So, in fact, there were stages 1, 2B to 4A. You had about 8 plus 7, 15 trials. And this was for a patient number of 2,454 patients. So, now the question is, what is the outcome of these 2,454 patients with chemo RT versus RT? And how did it compare with the meta-analysis of Cochrane, which was shown earlier in the morning, of radiotherapy and hypothermia versus radiotherapy alone. Well, <clears throat> let's see. So I come back to the odds ratio. And here, what I've tried to do is, I've tried to plot all the trials which chemo here, 
and all the trials which had hypothermia and radiotherapy versus radiotherapy alone what we find is that overall whether you're using chemotherapy chemo radiotherapy or hypothermia radiotherapy certainly it is better than using radiotherapy alone for stage 2b to 4a because the odd ratio is about 1.909 but then we wanted to know which is a better is chemo RT better or hypothermia and radiotherapy is better so then if you look at it although it's 1.904 both together but the overall benefit with chemo RT was RT the odds ratio is 1.4 and for hypothermia and radiotherapy versus radiotherapy alone from the six trials is in fact 2.684. So it's much higher than what you gain by chemo RT. So the odds ratios for complete response of chemo RT was RT is 1.4 and it's almost half of what you would achieve by using hypothermia and radiotherapy. Well, people may say, complete response is okay. What happens to the long term? Okay, let's try to see the long term. But prior to that, the risk difference, as we have seen for earlier, and the risk difference here shows that the risk difference is, in fact, 16%. There is a higher probability of achieving a complete response with hypothermia and radiotherapy compared to chemo RT. Now let's look at the long-term response. So this is the long-term. I'm not going to the odds ratios. I'm just going to come to the risk difference because that is what I think is the bottom line. And here is the plot for the risk difference here. So these are the chemo RT arms and these are hypothermia and radiotherapy arms. And what you have is 18% higher probability of long-term low collision control with hypothermia and radiotherapy compared to chemo RT. Well, what about the patients alive? Survival. Now, as I said, survival is a variable factor because some two years, some three years, some four years, some five years. So there was no way that I could compute a survival at a given point. So I just looked at how many patients were surviving at the end of the trial. And what we found that there was still a 2% higher probability with hypothermia compared to chemo RT in terms of even for survival. The third, fourth important parameter which now comes is the toxicity. We don't want just to gain in survival, gain in complete response, but what about the toxicity? So acute toxicity is here for you. And there is difference here you can see now the curves for both is about 0 0.79. For overall chemo RT, it's 0.15. For hypothermia and radiotherapy, it's 0 0.003, which basically means that the, there is a 15% higher probability with chemo radiotherapy compared to hypothermia and radiotherapy. So that's the story. You have a treatment modality which gives you a better local control, long-term control, survival without adding toxicity. So evidence is there. We just need to explore it. What about the late toxicities? Well, that is also a crucial factor. Unfortunately, the late toxicities are similar. So, if I have to summarize what we saw for cervix, this is what the table is for you. Complete response with hypothermia increase of 16%. Long-term local control increases by 18%. Patient alive increases by 2%. Acute toxicity is lesser by 15%. Similar late toxicity. So now I leave it to you to decide which is the treatment option you would like to adopt for your patients. Is it chemo RT based on the NCI guidelines or recommendations or hypothermia and radiotherapy? I think 
I should get this because every one of us, based on the evidence, should agree that hypothermia and radiotherapy appears to have a better outcome with lesser morbidity than chemo radiotherapy in locally advanced cancer cervix. So that's the subgroup which we are talking about. So finally, I would conclude. As we have seen, A, that hypothermia along with radiotherapy is an effective and a safe treatment modality. For all sides, we saw that the odds ratio was 2.3 in favor of radiotherapy and hypothermia. For recurrent breast cancer, complete responses improved by about 22% with hypothermia. For head and neck, it improved by about 25%. And for locally advanced cancer cervix stages 2B to 4A, certainly radiotherapy and hypothermia appears to be significantly higher, giving a higher therapeutic benefit than chemo RT in terms of complete response, in terms of long-term local regional response, in terms of survival, in terms of lesser acute morbidity, and similar late morbidity. So, why not integrate hypothermia with radiotherapy and chemotherapy? And this I pose the question and leave it to you. That what steps therefore needs to be done to further integrate this hypothermia and radiotherapy and perhaps chemotherapy as a standard treatment option in specific sites. Thank you. Uh, you are welcome with your questions. Are there any questions? Uh, may you tell us uh, what was the source of heating in the case of hypothermia? What was the source of? Source of temperature, heating. Heating? Yes. See, this is a collection of uh, various trials. And depending on the sites, I think for local regional recurrent breast cancer, most of them used radio frequencies. And even for cervix, they used uh, radio frequency using either the BSD units, ma mainly BSD units, and for head and neck also. So they were variable depending on what center they have. And most of these centers, they try to adopt a temperature around 41 to 42 degrees Celsius. Uh, and my last question, please uh, tell me, uh, what do you think about magnetic hypothermia, the perspectives and uh, probability of applications? What, what hypothermia? Magnetic hypothermia magnetic by using hypo magnetic well, nanoparticles. I think it's uh, very interesting. I think uh, there was also, I think, this question. See, now what we are talking till now is an external hypothermia. But what is perhaps coming up in the near future is a nanoparticle based hypothermia. And when you are using a nanoparticle-based hypothermia, we, we did hear some, some discussion on the last speaker about the ferromagnetic. So either it is a carbon or a ferromagnetic or a gold nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles have a special affinity by when you inject them, they can cross the blood vessel barrier by a phenomena which is called EPR. And they tend to concentrate mainly in the tumor tissues and when you are subjected them to magnetic field they get realigned and once they are dealigned there is heating is there. So I think the nanoparticle based magnetic hypothermia is certainly one thing which I would be looking forward to because A it gives a specificity, B it gives a local heating, C it gives us the ability to load these to design these nanoparticles based on various parameters, you know, receptors, we can use, you know, chemotherapy agents which can be tagged with these nanoparticles. So I think the nanoparticle based magnetic hypothermia or the NMR which we call is what 
is coming up in the near future and I certainly would be very closely watching it. Coming to the previous uh, discussion about the use in glioblastoma, I think there is a company, Macfords from Germany and they have trials which were conducted perhaps in Munich or Berlin, uh, I'm not sure about, but that has shown that for recurrent glioblastoma multiformis, they had injected these nanoparticles inside the tumor by making a borehole and they were able to raise the temperature because then you are not talking about a classical hypothermia where the temperature is around 39 to 41 degrees centigrade. There you are almost going to an ablative temperature and the mean temperature there was what was reported for those patients were around 50 degrees. The best thing was that even with this, they were, achieve, they were able to achieve a local tumor control of this recurrent tumors much better than what the chemozolomite has done it. So I think they have, uh, they have been future, further studies which they have used in prostate. So you know, it is, it is not that it has been only working in the lab, it has come into the clinics. So it is up to us to then further explore that how best we can use it. So I see that magnetic nanoparticles is certainly one thing which we need to look very closely. Сергей Васильевич. I would like to ask the following. I would like to ask about breast cancer. So, as far as, I, as, as all of us know, it could be luminal A and luminal B, breast cancer, and they are completely different uh, in terms of sensitiveness to chemotherapy. And there can also be hormone-sensitive breast cancer when uh, chemotherapy is not needed. And only by means of hormones you can uh, reach certain effect of treatment. And there is also breast cancer, the triple negative one, when the receptors uh, to the steroids and are two negative ones. So, and at last there is breast cancer where we have mutations and the so-called HER2 plus ones. So, where out of these cancers, out of these variants of cancer, breast cancer, where do we predominantly use hyperthermia? Where the most indications are? Because in terms of uh, treatment modalities, radiological uh, treatment would be different. They would be different in terms of the uh, single dose. They would be different in terms of summary dose. It's an important uh, query which uh, I think uh, people have shown the concern. But there are two things Mike, which I would like to stay. Please. Sorry? Okay. One is that all the studies which I showed for breast cancer, which are done for mainly for recurrent breast cancers, and these studies have not reported on the various molecular parameters that you are, you know, wanting to know because uh, if it's a luminal A, luminal B, or it's a BRCA positive, negative, HER2. These are some of the points which have not been addressed by any of these studies. So I certainly cannot, uh, you know, try to say that this is feasible in that. But what I can say, not in breast, but at least in head and neck and cancer cervix. Head and neck and cancer cervix, we are forgetting one important thing is the HPV. We know that HPV is one of the causative factors for both. And radiotherapy patients of HPV positive are much more effectively treated by radiotherapy compared to, you know, HPV negative tumors. And what has been also shown from the Amsterdam group is that hypothermia is also toxic for HPV positive tumors. 
So a combination of radiotherapy and hypothermia for HPV positive tumors is certainly one which should be explored. But none of these trials actually were done in a period where we didn't know about all this thing. So I think in the future, when we design a phase three randomized trial, these could be incorporated as a stratification factor and thereby try to look into all these parameters which are certainly important. If it is a triple negative tumors, if hypothermia helps, I think certainly that is one of the... Because hypothermia not only has the properties which we have said, it is an immunostimulant. And if it is an immunostimulant, you really don't know what it all can do. So these have to be explored in the near future. Thank you. Uh, now my second question, and it's about the second type of cancer, the cervical cancer that you mentioned in your talk. So in the treatment of um, grade three, four cervical cancers, uh, the principal significance is the technique of radiotherapy. What is the part of distance radiotherapy and how you do it? Is it comfort, comfort or is it just a traditional, conventional way? Then second, how much is the brachiotherapy, radiotherapy, and in what dose you uh, give this brachiotherapy? Then, how you sum up the biological effect, the bet of brachiotherapy, and thus the dis uh, and the distance radiotherapy, because it depends on what type of um, brachiotherapy you prefer. Is it high dose, mid dose, or low dose? And thus, when you sum up with the distance uh, radiotherapy and cavity uh, brachiotherapy, the summary of the biological parameters will be completely different. And uh, did you have uh, the same scheme of radiotherapy, I mean both distance and brachiotherapy? Is it just low dose in all the cases, mid dose in all the cases, or high dose in all cases? Is it conformal, conform, or if we speak about distance one, or is it just usual therapy, like 1.8 or 2 gray without any specific features or complicated pre-radiotherapy preparation? Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very, very crucial question. Uh, I believe that this question is not really for hypothermia, but I think it's almost like a general question that you would like to pose me. Although, it, if I'm using with hypothermia, it has some relevance. So, A, number one, I would say that my treatment techniques will not change, and I repeat, not change, whether I use hypothermia or not in cancer cervix. That is one. Because as I've shown and, and as I believe, that hypothermia will not increase the toxicity of my radiation. So there is no way that I would like to change my treatment techniques of radiation therapy if I use hypothermia. Number two, I strongly believe that for a stage 2B248 cancer cervix, treatment of cervix has to consist of external beam and brachytherapy. Brachytherapy without brachytherapy is an incomplete treatment. So a combination of these two is essential. Number three, if I use external beam hypothermia, should I use an IMRT technique? Should I use a conformal technique? Or could I use a standard box technique? I feel that cervix is an organ which is mobile, which is pushed like a prostate from both sides. And therefore, I'm, when I'm treating a cervix, A, I'm not only treating the cervix, I'm treating the pelvic nodes. And therefore, I feel I should not try to cut corners around the cervix because 
my treatment planning on day one is basically a snapshot which I take of my CT on the day one, which in no circumstances is going to be same for five weeks of treatment. So to me, my patient's safety is to be there and I would straight away go for a standard four field box technique. I don't believe in cervix that I go with all those contours and fashions, no. It is a standard four field. You cover the nodes, you cover the cervix. Because this cervix tumor would regress over the time. Am I going to do an adaptive radiotherapy in which I do the planning every week? I don't think it's practically possible in any department. So if I cannot do a adaptive planning for every patient on every time, I perhaps would like to be safer and not cut corners. Number four. Whether I use a high dose or a medium dose or a low dose, till date there has been no study reported that an HDR actually has increased the toxicity compared to an LDR. The reason for this is simple. When I'm using a single low dose applicator, I'm putting that applicator for 24 hours and two hours depending on what is the dose rate, whether I'm using a Manchester technique or not. Whether I, when I'm using a HDR, I'm in fact using multiple applications, which is three, four, five, depending on the department protocols. So every time I'm using a, a applicator inside the patient, my bladder max and rectal max are not going to be at the same point over the five treatments that I'm doing it because it is going spaced over five weeks. So if my B max is not on the same point, the toxicity of that point is not going to be a cumulative toxicity. So I am not worried about that. What I'm worried is that I should be taking care of the entire tumor. So my thing is that if there is a parameter invasion, I would like to use either an applicator with a parameter boost, whether by brachytherapy or if there is no parameter, I can use a standard tandem and an award. So I would be more interested to look at the coverage of the tumor by brachytherapy because that gives me the maximum input. Number five, and I think that was a very crucial question, is that how do I combine the doses of teletherapy and brachytherapy? Now here I would like to say, that when I'm using a teletherapy, my field or the volume is completely different from what I'm using a brachytherapy. So there is no need of a combination, even though radiobiologically I can't combine. Because when I'm using a brachytherapy, the dose is there only in the cervix. And a cervix has a high tolerance dose. And this is, has to be a very specific dose, which is not possible by using a radiobiological formula to combine. People have tried all those formulas which are there, but I don't think any one of them has really shown to be. So I would make it very simple because cervix is a very common disease globally. So treat with simple techniques, cover the field completely, use definitely brachytherapy and I was very happy to, in your department to see the brachytherapy planning and that's a must. And I think once you do it, add hypothermia to it, that's it. So you should be getting a good results with that. So I would keep it very simple and straight. In your investigation, uh, in good difference in uh, irradiation volume in stage three and stage four in uh, cancer on cervix. Yes, uh, this is very principal. Okay. Basically, for stage three and stage four, my external volume would remain the same. That is, I would treat the whole pelvis. I would not like to go and treat with an extended parotid field because that certainly would increase the morbidity. And people who have tried to do it, I think they have faced a lot of morbidity with that. So I would like to keep the pelvic fields both same. My change would be mainly when I'm using a brachytherapy. If my stage 3A, then I at the end of five weeks of treatment, when I'm planning for brachytherapy, I would look at the parametral regression. If there is a no regression, I would use simple intracavitary tandem anovoid with the Fletcher's applicator. If there is a parametral, uh, parametral infiltration of one side, 
at least half of the parameter, then either I would go with the VNA applicator and try to boost the parameter with the interstitial needles, or I would use a mupet yeah. with an interstitial. If in stage 3B, if it is both sides, and if more than half of the parameter is there, then I would use a simple mupet and put an interstitial brachytherapy on both sides, because that is what is going to cover my tumor. Simple intracavity will not cover my tumor. So I would be more concerned to assess the tumor response at the end of five weeks of brachytherapy, and depending on the field that I get, I would rather plan my brachytherapy applications, yeah, whether it is a simple Fletcher suit, suit or whether it is a VNA ring applicator or whether it is a mupid applicator. Yeah. So I will tailor my requirement based at the five weeks of my treatment. Thank you. Uh, and uh, what type, uh, 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 what type uh, radiotherapy, photon radiotherapy uh, do you use in your investigation in stage 3, 6 or 10 MEF and stage 4, 6 or 10 MEF. This is the very principle. 6 or 10? 10 MEF. No, no I, I didn't get your question. I didn't get your, sorry, I didn't get your question. 6 or 10, what, what is 6 and what? 6, for, uh, six or 10 for s stage 3. E and sixth or ten MEF uh, for stage four. Oh, mega electron volts. Well, I think six or ten when I'm using an MV, I can use either of six or ten. The thing is that if I'm using a six MV proton uh, beam, I will not use a parallel opposed field because by using a parallel opposed field, I'm going to increase the dose to the bladder and the rectum. The dose for, I mean, if you're normalizing for it becomes 110% there. So I'm automatically going to give a 1.1 a gray compared to, you know, what I have. So 6 MV, no. If the patient is not very bulky, I would certainly go with the four field technique because that is what actually spares my bladder and my rectum. So whether it is six or 10, I will certainly not use a parallel opposed fields for these patients. I will use a four field box technique with a good coverage of the primary site and the pelvic nodes and spare the rectum and the bladder as much as possible. Two field techniques in cervix, I think, should not be used until unless you use a really 20 MV photon where you can have a higher dose in between without causing problems for the bladder and rectum. So I think I would like to check on that and it all depends on the bulkiness of the patient. But most likely 99.9% .9 I would go with the four field because that is the safest bet that I would have.